and that has so everyone should hear that. The video will be recorded with the cooperation of the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties uh, Master Gardener Volunteer Program. So thank you so much, Cornell uh, Cooperative, for that. It's going to be very helpful to have that recorded. Um, and last but not least, I'd love to introduce our chair of our ELEC committee, Jerry Smith. So Jerry Smith, I'm going to give it over to you. Thank you, Princess Diana. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, fellow gardeners. I'm actually not the chair. I'm a committee member. Uh, and ELIC, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> ELIC stands for Enriching Life, Increasing Knowledge. We are sponsored by the North Chatham Library. Uh, we are supported in part by a grant from the Fund for Columbia County for the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation and also the Bank of Green County. And we do appreciate uh, the support that they provide for us because that enables Jerry, I believe you were muted. Yes, Jerry, you're muted. Somebody Hold on a minute. I was okay. Good morning, fellow gardeners. I guess I had a dry run there. I, I had to unmute myself, which I forgot about. I am the, um, I'm on the committee uh, for the ELIC committee. ELIC stands for Enriching Life, Increasing Knowledge. We are sponsored by the North Chatham Library. Uh, we are supported in part uh, from a fund for Columbia County for the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation and also the Bank of Green County. And we do appreciate their support because it enables us to provide these programs to you. I now want to introduce Sandra Linnell. Sandra is the Community Horticulture Program Coordinator for Cornell Cooperative Extension. Sandra? Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Sandra Linnell. I am the Community Horticulture Program Coordinator here at the Cornell Cooperative Extension Columbian Green Counties. To, get, to give a small background of our Master Gardener Program, the Cornell Master Gardener Program was established to assist Cooperative Extension to provide horticulture knowledge and skills to local communities and garden public. Today, I would like to present to one of our amazing master gardeners, Frida Pierce. Pierre has been volunteering with us since 2016, and today she will be presenting a great topic for this fall named Putting the Garden to Bed. Please give your attention to Frida Pierce. Thank you. Hello, everyone. After that uh, impressive introduction, I'm sort of quaking in my boots as to how this talk will go, but let's uh, forge ahead. Give. Okay, when you look out your window, you see that your leaves have changed. This fall has been unusually pleasant this year, so it's hard to get down to tending to our various gardens, our vegetable garden, flowers, shrubs, trees, and lawn. You are trying to squeeze the last few string beans from your plants, your last few peppers, the kale and collards are tall, the Brussels sprouts are still growing, you may have planted some late season crops such as spinach, beets, radishes, and turnips. You've spent your summer enjoying the fruits of your labor in the garden, the bounty of tomatoes, peas, beans, lettuce, spinach, from your vegetable garden and the fragrance and beauty of your flowers and shrubs. Now it's time to think about putting your garden to bed. Let's talk about how to move forward. I would like to attribute some of the content of the slide 
presentation to various Cornell Cooperative Extensions in New York State, such as Warren, Rensselaer, Herkimer counties, and also to the Penn State Extension. And these links are included in the handouts. I would like to thank Sue Charbonneau for some of the pictures in this deck because she used to give this talk for the extension. The rest of the pictures come from various areas very close to you from East Chatham, Chatham, New Lebanon. Um, so uh, feel free to enjoy them because that's pretty much in your surroundings. When you have questions, if you move your mouth, mouse to the bottom of the screen, you will see a box called chat. If you click on that, it'll open up and you can type your questions into the chat box. We will cover all aspects of fall preparation for your gardens, including cleaning up your vegetable garden, storing annuals and tender bulbs indoors, overwintering them, tending to your perennial gardens, your shrubs and trees, seed collection if you wish to, lawns, and most importantly, cleaning your equipment. So far, you will have harvested your tomatoes, squash, peppers, and bean plants. If there are any remaining, they're done for the year. If the plants are free of disease, ask them, add them to the compost pile. Separate diseased plants and burn or discard them with your garbage. <laughs> Root vegetables such as carrots, leeks, parsnips, radishes, turnips, beets, and Brussels sprouts can stay in your garden for a little longer. You can keep harvesting them through the early winter. The same is true for pumpkins, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and onions. Some of you might have decided to start fall crops in late August, such as lettuce, spinach, or kale. These can be harvested until they stop producing, which should be soon. Pick all your green tomatoes that are left and store them indoors. Clean out your vegetable garden thoroughly to remove any disease or critters that might overwinter in the soil. You can mulch with straw around your beets and uh, root vegetables and your herbs such as chives, oregano, and thyme. Chives, oregano, and thyme can stay all winter and regenerate in the spring, giving you fresh herbs for your cooking all winter. Clean out your vegetable beds of weeds, diseased plants to help discourage in insects and diseases from overwintering in the beds. Place any degradable material into a compost pile Put the diseased plants into a burn pile or discard with household garbage. You do not want to contaminate your compost with disease, especially if the compost does not get hot enough. If you don't already have a compost pile, start one. Some of you might want to preserve vegetables and herbs if you are unable to use all of them. You may want to gather herbs to dry or make various um, things like herb salt and herb vinegars. You may want to pickle cucumbers and peppers and freeze string beans, leafy greens, such as spinach, kale, collards, and Swiss chard. There's a website that gives you recipes and tips on how to preserve food at home. There are new instructions for canning vegetables at the National Center for Home food preservation. I've included the link in the handout. This site can also be accessed through, through the extension website. You can dry herbs by hanging them upside down in a cool place like a basement or in the oven at 190 degrees or in a dehumidifier or even in the microwave. 
Here is a picture of drying a fragile herb such as tarragon. Sometimes air drying or oven drying changes the color of the herb. Microwaving appears to maintain the color better than air or oven drying. Pick uniformly sized leaves and place on paper towels. Microwave them a minute at a time until they are crumbly. Store them in labeled jars. You can also make herb salts by pureeing the herbs with salt and herb vinegars by chopping them up and putting them in either wine or cider vinegar. <clears throat> Kale collards and Swiss chard should be trimmed, cut up, and parboiled in salt water. You can then flatten them out and put them in freezer bags and freeze, making sure that you get all the air out. This can be added to soups or stews when you're ready to use them. Always use freezer grade bags. Do not can tomatoes from dead or frost killed vines. Green tomatoes are more acidic than ripened fruit and can be canned safely. The next thing you have, chore you have to do is to try to improve the soil for the next growing season. At the end of the season, the soil in your vegetable garden may be somewhat spent. To help improve yield and the following summer, you should rotate your crops. You can add a layer of compost, but that might be better to do in the spring as some of the nutrients might leach away with rains or snow melt. Another way to enrich the soil is to grow cover crops. A cover crop includes various seed plants such as winter rye, red clover, fava beans, sweet pea, and buckwheat, to name a few. This green biomass improves the soil by adding nitrogen and minerals and keeps the weeds to a minimum. Keep weeding. Don't allow weeds to become overwintering homes for insect eggs and disease. Remove weeds before winter hits. You can also surface till the soil to help reduce pests in the soil by exposing underground grubs and pupae to the sun, birds, and cooler temperatures. After the frost, add mulch to your beds to prevent erosion and compacting. Add a thick layer of mulch or straw over beds where root crops will be stored in the ground before harvest. In the spring, be sure to test the soil pH before you add compost. Mix in the compost into an inch or two of soil. We will now move on to perennials. Here is a picture of a perennial bed overgrown from COVID neglect. As you can see, the plants are all intermingled and it's hard to determine where exactly the parent plant is. Look at your perennial beds. See what needs to be divided. Are the plants too crowded? Are the plants in front too tall? Are some too short and shaded by the taller plants, thus stunted in growth? Is it a good location for the plant? Do they have room to grow and not crowd out other plants? What plants may need to be discarded? For example, in this bed, a lot of plants need to be ruthlessly cut back and the bed needs to be weeded. Some plants need to be discarded, such as sumac that have taken root from airborne seeds. The thinking has changed regarding maintaining perennial beds. We no longer cut everything down, we leave some as we will discuss. Plants that can be divided in the fall are hostas, peonies, iris, Rudbeckia, yarrow, daylilies, campanula, monarda, or bee balm, echinacea, and phlox. Some plants such as yarrow, rudbeckia, mountain mint, echinacea, are self-seeding and can spread out. You can always take them up to share with neighbors and friends, but beware of sharing pests such as jumping worms. Monarda or bee balm, artemisia, daylilies, peonies, hostas, and yarrow can be cut down. Bee balm and phlox sometimes carry diseases, so it's a good idea to cut them down. Some gardeners cut them to the ground, others leave a foot or so, so that in the spring they can recognize the denuded plant. If you have lavender, you should harvest the flowers 
and cover the plants with hay so they do not go through freeze thaw, thaw cycles. They're a little fragile. Echinacea, milkweed. If you trim them, be aware of the seed pods. Milkweed can spread out over your property. So be careful in cutting them. Gather the pods so they don't take over. If your bed is against your house or near your driveway, you may want to cut them down and weed the bed. If your beds are in open areas, you can leave some plants standing for winter interest. Be judicious in what you divide and eliminate. Collect seed heads to avoid reseeding. Water the plant to be divided thoroughly. Prepare the soil at the new site. Crop the roots in a circle around the plant, sort of leaf width to be divided. Lift the plant with a spading fork or a shovel. Shake off excess soil and any attached weeds. Use a knife or a blade to divide pieces that cannot be pulled apart. Replant the new pieces immediately and water thoroughly. For example, this is a crowded iris bed. The rhizomes are on the surface and there are many of them. Divide up the rhizomes and plant three in the space and, and where in this case there were more than 20. Mound the soil under the rhizome and spread out the roots and bury them deep so they'll bloom next summer. Pot up the rest and give to friends. The same can be done with grasses. Overgrown grass plantings can diminish and die. Although dividing a root ball into segments and extracting to replant some of them requires significant effort. This may be better done in the spring. Remember that if you do share your plants to give them free of any kind of disease, otherwise you will lose your friends. Bearded iris should be done as soon as possible around Labor Day. Ideally, peonies are divided or moved in October. Most of the spring and summer blooming hardy perennials can be divided and replanted in September or October. It's hard with warmer temperatures to gauge when to move, but there should be time for plant to take root before it goes dormant. Fall blooming perennials are best done in early spring. Reason to completely remove plants. Why are prudent discard plants? You don't like the plant. It's the wrong plant for the site. You can move it to a new site or give it away. Plants didn't do well because it succumbed to insect damage, disease or blight. Plants may need too much care, like roses or hollyhocks, and your soil is not amenable to these plants. Like we all know, in our area, we mostly have either clay or shale. Hollyhocks, although beautiful, are devoured by Japanese beetles and look terrible after. It's also subject to rust and other diseases. Bee balm or monarda is invasive, but bees love them. So keep them in check. Certain mints, mountain mint, hummingbird mint, yarrow are also favorite of bees and butterflies, but need to be curbed regularly. Plants such as coreopsis and heliopsis, if you cut them down and the leaves are absent they, in, in the winter, they look like weeds in the spring and you might accidentally pull them out. Label your plants, say with a flag or a wooden stick, so you know what and where they are. To recap, cutting back after frost improves the appearance of the garden, provides less work in the spring and lessens seed dispersal. Cut back herbaceous non-woody perennials to about three inches. Perennials with dry stems should be cut back to ground level to make the garden look neat and remove insect eggs. Leave attractive seed heads to help feed birds and add winter interest to your backyard. If disease hits your shrubs and perennials, cut off the disease stems and leaves and put them in a burn pile or garbage. Chrysanthemums, for example, mulch carefully. 
Spring blooming clematis wait to prune until February. So you can see the buds. Buds come off the old wood. With fall blooming clematis, which blooms on new wood, you can prune after forest. <clears throat> Leave some flowers and vegetation standing. Purple cone flowers and berries from various plants, such as winter berries, arrowwood, viburnum, holly, and others provide food for birds that do not migrate. Grasses and plants such as Rus Russian sage, you can leave as they also provide shelter for various insect and avian life. If you garden on a slope, Penn State Extension recommends that you leave dead stems to prevent erosion by winter wind or water. Some of these plants provide interest to the landscape in the winter, compost only health, healthy material. To say again, burn diseased plants and weeds. We will move on to annuals. Annuals that are past their prime can be pulled out. They can be also brought indoors. Begonias are cheery and will bloom indoors over the winter, but they need sun. Other annuals can be brought inside as well. These are impatiens, salvias, geraniums, herbs, to name a few. All of these plants need sun to thrive indoors. Check for insects and spray with insecticidal soap before bringing them indoors. Some plants provide cuttings such as coleus, geraniums, brugamansia, to grow new plants. Again, do not bring in insects or plant disease. Geraniums can also be stored indoors in a cool place in the winter and allowed to go dormant with occasional watering. Some gardeners suggest removing the soil and storing the plant in paper bags in the cellar or garage. Gladiolus, cannas, and dahlias, elephant ears, and caladium are tender perennials, which must be dug up after a hard frost or before the ground freezes. If left in the ground, they will not survive the winter. In some cases, you can start earlier. For example, with gladioli, when they've either turned brown or have stopped producing, and are no longer actively growing in the late fall before a hard frost, it's time to harvest the corns, wash them and store them for the winter in a cool place in mesh bags. Dig up dahlia tubers after a hard frost, do this on a dry day, remove the soil and the leaves from the tubers, wash and allow the tubers to dry and store in a cardboard box lined with newspaper and peat moss that's slightly damp, not wet. Ideal temperatures for storage is 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The same is applicable for canna and caladiums. If these are in a pot, they can be stored in a pot indoors in a cool place. Don't be discouraged by the sight of the uh, root ball in this slide. If yours looks kind of deformed, it's common for this area because of the shale and the rocks we have in our soil. Um, you can experiment with some of these perennials by bringing them indoors, provided you have a sunny place. And you have to protect them from drafts and keep them in a cool place with temperatures about 50 degrees bare rooted in paper bags, or cut the stems back about two thirds when potting up for spring. Prune roses in the fall to about two and a half feet and then protect them with burlap. Add eight to 12 inches of compost or dark soil to protect the bud union. Wrap hybrid teas, grandiflora, and floribunda with burlap and twine. The rugged rugosa require no winter prep, but it's best not to cut them to three or four feet height. 
as it's an ideal height for deer grazing. The rows of Sharon can be trimmed to about three branches, about six inches from the ground. Make sure there are some nodes, it comes back easily. It's hardy and forgiving. Empty annual beds or mulch areas that are bare to cut down on weeds and unwanted seeds that are windborne. Add soil amendments, compost and leaves to improve the soil and mulch to keep the soil protected. Mulching perennial beds is done to protect them from fluctuating freeze thaw temperature cycles. Mulching of perennials should be done only after the hard frost and after the ground freezes. Water all newly planted trees and shrubs periodically so they do not dry out. For the container garden, empty the pots of soil and disinfect them with bleach solution. If the pots are stored outside, turn them upside down so water doesn't get inside and cause them to crack. The leaves can be left in the garden to provide nutrients and to protect the soil. Another task that you might set yourself in the fall is to plant trees or transplant trees and shrubs. <clears throat> Some gardeners suggest root pruning shrubs, any trees or shrubs that you intend to move in the spring. <coughs> Excuse me. This encourages good root formation. The pruning is done using the circumference of the leaves of the tree or the shrub. For some plants, moving is best done in the spring. Protect the shrub just before the first snow is forecast. Apply dormant oil in the fall if necessary. For example, if your magnolia develops magnolia scale, you do not want to, it to overwinter. You can treat it with horticultural oil and trim badly infested branches. Dormant oils were first used to control insect pests on fruit trees, where an effective control that was, wasn't harmful to pollinators and was safe for ingestion by humans was needed. The oil covers the leaf and limb surfaces, suffocating insects and some insect eggs, which reduces harmful insect population. Dormant oils don't leave a toxic residue and dissipate quickly making them ideal for use on blooming plants that will have pollinators arrive later during the growing season. It's also considered safe to use around humans and pets. What pests, pests, not pets, <laughs> do these dormant oil control? <clears throat> dormant Oil sprays can control a variety varieties of insects, such as aphids, mealybugs, thrips, white flies, adelgids, caterpillar eggs, leaf hoppers, scale, and mites. With the destructive newly discovered crepe model bark scale, dormant oil saves crepe models. When should dormant oil be applied? Remember to read each product label and follow directions carefully. You can apply them in the form, if it so suggests on the bottle. You can protect your shrubs from wind damage and deer grazing and snow by using either plywood tripods or burlap. Plant trees and shrubs in the early fall so roots can develop and spread. If the weather is dry, keep them well watered. Even at this time of year, plants need water. If the fall has been dry, all evergreens and trees and shrub planted less than a year ago need adequate moisture to avoid winter dehydration and stress. Winter survival rate is much higher for well watered plants. Tree trunks can be protected with wrap to prevent deer from damaging them. Trees and shrubs such as arbobite, cedar should be wrapped with burlap to prevent deer grazing. The next task you might set yourself is to plant bulbs in the fall. 
Budding bulbs are the first sign of spring. They bring color to the landscape. Plant spring bulbs in late October, early November. You will appreciate it in the spring. You can plant daffodils, tulips, hyacinth, grape hyacinth, crocus, to name a few. Look for bulbs that are plump and firm. It's typically, typically best to avoid bulbs that are soft and mushy or have mold growing on them. Also look for big bulbs. The bigger they are, the more they bloom compared to smaller bulbs of the same variety. Generally dig a hole two to three times deeper than the bulb is tall. So if you have a three inch bulb, dig a hole six to nine inches deep. If the bulb has a pointed end, that's usually the size that faces up. If you don't see a pointy side, look for where the roots come out. That end goes down. Bulbs appreciate well-drained soil, rich in organic matter. So mix compost or blood meal into your bulb planting holes to ensure good blooming. This is especially important if you have heavy clay soil or the ground that stays wet. A good drink after you plant them will encourage them to send out roots and become established more quickly. A good watering will eliminate air pockets in the soil that could cause your bulbs to dry out too. However, critters love bulbs. Chipmunks and squirrels dig them up. So to prevent that, tamp down areas where you planted the bulb so it doesn't look like freshly turned soil. Spread a layer of mulch to hide your bulb holes. You can add <clears throat> bone meal, but bone meal, chipmunks love that, so avoid that. If that doesn't help, weigh down a piece of mesh or chicken wire over the soil to keep the critters from digging. It'll be safe to remove the protective mesh once uh, bulbs appear to start sprouting out of the ground. For the, a dramatic show of spring flower, flowering bulbs, plant smaller perennial species such as crocus or skilla over bigger bulbs such as daffodils, tulips, and lilies. That way you quite get twice the color in the same space. You can also plant garlic and shallots in the fall. Garlic is one of the few crops that you can harvest in the middle of the vegetable garden season when you plant them in the fall. Plant cloves of organic hard neck garlic in the fall, early November. Cover with a thick layer of straw or mulch and wait for spring. Remove the outer layers of the clove, but leave a thin layer of skin intact. Set the cloves root side down four to six inches apart in a row, one and a half inches to two inches apart. And cover with one to two inches of fine soil. Put down six inches of mulch or straw for winter protection or plant in the ground five to six inches deep if not using mulch. Planting again the biggest and healthiest organic garlic bulbs and shallot bulbs you can find is best. There's a direct relationship between the size of the bulbs and the cloves you plant and the size of the bulbs and cloves you will harvest. In the early spring fertilize, excess nitrogen in the soil does not yield a good crop. So fertilize with slow release fertilizer the first leaves from the garlic will appear, then later a garlic scape, the curly seed head that's delicious when cut from the plant and fried with a bit of oil. Another tip is to start with a weed free bed and then plant garlic cloves and top with a thick layer of straw or mulch. The straw will keep the weeds down, minimize heaving due to freezing and thawing and make it easier for gardening in the spring. Garlic has a shallow root system and will stop growing in dry, dry condition or when the roots get too hot. Water the garlic bed after planting thoroughly. 
Now you may want to save some seeds. It's thought to be a complex process, but it's simple to start out with the flu varieties. Some crops like peas, beans, lettuce, and tomato are great for beginning seed savers. These annual self-pollinating crops require little or no isolation, and only a few plants are needed to reliably produce a bunch of seeds. Why save seeds? Build up a community and your own stock of seeds. You may have a plant that you really like and would like to grow them again. You can get a lot of seeds from a few plants. It helps save money. Helps keep local seed varieties and inher inherited seed varieties alive. Not all plants flower, set seed, and die in a single grow growing season. Those that do, like lettuce, tomatoes, and peppers are called annuals. As an aside, a pepper is really a fragile perennial, but you can collect their seeds annually. Biennials such as carrots and onions don't flower until their second growing season after they have gone through a cold period. Some long-lived plants like apple trees and asparagus are perennials surviving and flowering for many years. Start out with self-pollinating and open pollinating varieties. Open pollinating varieties will retain their distinct characteristics as long as they are mated with an individual of the same breed. This means with a little care and planning, the seeds you produce will be true to type, keeping their distinct traits generation after generation, as long as they do not cross-pollinate with other varieties of the same species. Do not save hybrid varieties because your next crop may not be the same as the previous years and you may not be able to have reproducible versions. One example is sun gold tomatoes. Well, you might like the variety, a different variety every year, so it's up to you what seeds you save. For crops, such as eggplants, cucumbers, squash, the seeds are not always mature when the fruits are ready to eat. Eggplant, cucumber, summer squash fruits are eaten when the fruits are young, mature and edible. But before the seeds are actually mature, you can see this in plants that have gone beyond the edible stage. The seed coat has a tougher consistency. This is true of melons as well. This means that the seed savers need to leave a few fruits to fully mature in the garden when they want the seeds. Lettuce and beans and peas are allowed to harden on the plant and can be removed from the pod once the seeds are dry and hard. Collecting seeds can be as simple as going out to the garden, hand picking a few mature seed pods and bringing them into the house for further cleaning and drying. Lettuce can grow tall and produce seed when the leaves turn bitter and the flowers appear. And these can be allowed to dry up, or in other words, go to seed, then dried and harvested. With fruits such as squash, eggplant, melons, cucumbers, they're allowed to mature on the vine and either crushed or cut open. The seeds are extracted from the flesh and the pulp before the seeds are dried. Tomato seeds are ready when tomatoes are ripe. In this case, you can spoon out the seeds with the pulp, dilute it one to four with water. Keep for a couple of days stirring occasionally in a, in a place where it's not disturbed until the seeds settle at the bottom of the jar. You will see the seeds all together and you will see a mushy pulp layer on top. The seeds can be gathered and washed and dried on paper plates by the window for a few days. Bag the seeds in all cases and store in a cool place. Now we get to pruning. Pruning is a class all in all <coughs> on its own. It's best to wait until trees, shrubs, and woody plants 
uh, such as fruit trees, rhododendrons, or hydrangeas go dormant before pruning. This may be done in the early spring after the snow melts, but before the ground thaws. Do not prove evergreens. I'm sorry, do not prune evergreens. You do not want to encourage new growth at this time. Also, fall pruning allows the sap to run, making it easy for insects to creep into the cut and making the tree vulnerable to disease. Pruning in the fall is to be avoided. Decay fungi are windborne and move around in the fall. Only prune after the tree is dormant in the late winter or early spring before the trees start to bud. Pruning fruit trees and shrubs require a lesson all on its own and is best done in an orchard with hands-on instruction. Now we move on to hydrangeas. Knowing how and when to prune hydrangeas involves first ident identifying what kind of shrubs you own. And it starts with determining whether they flower on old or new wood. Varieties that bloom on new wood are arborescence, incredible, paniculata, shown here on the upper half, and some species of microphylla. The flowers come from new growth from the base of the plant. They can be pruned almost at any time of year except summer. There are three steps to maintain the health and vigor of these hydrangeas, such as cutting off faded blooms in the late summer to improve the looks of the shrub, pruning out the oldest canes to improve vigor and cutting back the entire shrub in the late winter before new growth starts to appear. Additional tricks of the trade including, include leaving some of the older branches as a framework for new growth. This type of hydrangeas tend to open up and get floppy. Many gardeners also advocate cutting the shrubs all the way back to the ground, which they say often produces bigger flowers. Panicle hydrangeas can be cut to the ground or just a few feet above the soil depending on the size of plant you want to maintain. Old wood hydrangeas shown in the bottom two panels of this slide are more mop head, look like a mop head, big leaf, lace cap and oak leaf hydrangeas. Old wood is simply last year's wood. Hydrangeas that bloom on old wood set their flower buds in late summer on stalks that have been on the plant since the previous year. These shrubs required very little pruning. In fact, you can ignore them most of the time. But if you must prune, knowing when and what to cut is the key because the, the more old wood you take, the fewer flowers you will have next summer. To maintain the health and vigor of your old wood, wood hydrangeas, immediately, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> immediately after flowering, and no later than July, prune flowering stems back to a pair of healthy buds. In the late winter or early spring, prune out weak or damaged stems, remove no more than one third of the oldest stalks, taking them down to ground level. Repeat the process every summer to rejuvenate your shrubs and control their shape. If you're going to fertilize once a season, fall is the time to do it. Rake up the leaves to compost or put in the garden as mulch or shred them in place with a lawnmower. According to the Michigan State University Extension, up to six inches of leaves can be shred on the lawn with no adverse effects. We often consider that leaving leaves on the lawn will create big bare spots in the spring. By leaving smaller pieces of leaves on the lawn, it returns the organic matter from the leaves to the lawn and you can increase the health of your lawn. Next year's lawn will be healthier with less weeds and crab grass. You can also rake the leaves and put them in your garden. Not only will it provide nutrients, but the leaf litter will provide habitat for small insects and animals to shelter there over the winter. Ticks also love leaf litter. And piles of leaf, if you, leaves are sometimes in, infected with ticks. 
If you keep those piles away from walking paths and areas near the ha house, you will avoid contact with ticks. Lower the mower blade after a hard frost and do one final mowing. Maintain your mower and your lawn. Now the last task that you have left is to maintain your tools. One of the things you need to worry about is transferring disease from your tools from this year to the next. So one of the most important things that you have to do is to clean your tools. But before we start on that, some of the things they need to do during the entire growing season is to keep a garden journal. Take photos and add notes about your plots and your plants, whether they thrived, the climate throughout the summer, adequate rainfall or dry, and crop rotation for your vegetables. As you know, last summer was terribly dry, and this summer was amazingly wet, you didn't have to water anything. In fact, it was so wet that some plants did not thrive and you got mold in uh, your hay piles and so on. The winter is also the time to repair and build more boxed raised beds, clean out cold frames, repair trellises and do other chores that shouldn't wait until spring. You can find a quote, warm day in the winter to do these tasks. Organize the space, check out what you need or want and start your holiday list. Detach and drain garden hoses, store in a dry place, space, prep outdoor faucets for the winter. Empty your rain barrel if you have one and store in a dry place. Clean out your planters and straw, store in a dry place. Now with garden tools and stakes and cages and garden ornaments, store them in a dry place for the winter. What you need to do with your tools is scrub off the crusted oil, soil I mean, and sanitize with a one-to-one -one ratio of mouthwash or Clorox and water. You can also use Brillo pads to scrape off any rust or encrusted soil on your shears and on your rakes. You can sharpen hoes and shears and shovels. Store fertilizers properly so they won't leak during, your win during the winter. Look out for potting soil, fertilizers, soil amendments, tools, and other supplies at your local nurseries, stock up and get ready for the spring at a discount. Plan your gardens, find some interesting new perennials or native plants for continuing interest. Prepare to start your vegetables from seed and find new varieties that piques your interest. Pick up that novel you've been wanting to read. You're ready for the winter. Everything's buttoned up. And it's almost time for the spring. The seed catalogs will arrive, won't it? Thank you very much for your kind attention. We are available to answer any questions. Please enter your questions into the chat box. Hello, this is Sandra. I am just um, reviewing the chat box. And the first question was, how much should I cut back the hydrangeas? Well, as I mentioned, those that grow on, I can't start my video, so you'll have to take it for granted, it's me talking. <laughs> um, those that grow on old wood, you shouldn't cut back at all uh, in the fall. Those that grow on new wood, you can cut back almost to the ground or about three inches from the ground or six inches from the ground. You won't kill the plant. The plant will probably come back 
next year healthier than it was this year. Thank you. Um, another question for the hydrangea, better to prune in fall or spring? The same for butterfly bush and nine bark. Nine bark, uh, you can prune off all the pathetic looking branches. They're the branches that sort of look like um, they will produce no leaves the following year. Um, what was the other butterfly bush? Yeah. I usually cut them down. They spread too. And so you have those flowering seed. Uh, be careful to gather those seed heads uh, so they don't fall all over the place. But you can cut them down too. Or if, you, if they're well sheltered, you can leave them so um, birds can eat the seeds. And as I said, with the hydrangeas, the ones that bloom on new wood, um, the paniculata and the, there were some species of microphylla and um, arborescence. Those are the ones you can cut all the way to the ground. The oak leaf and the mop heads, uh, you should not cut now. Uh, cut only right after flowering when you can see Otherwise, you won't get any flowers the next year. Thank you. Another question is, when should a scaly overgrown spiria be cut back? And how much should it be cut back? Overgrown spirea? Mm -hmm. I think you can cut it back in the fall. Yes. And you, if you're nervous about it, don't cut it back drastically. Just cut back all the gangly um, things, so you have nicely shaped bush. Is that, do you agree, Sandra? Yes, I definitely do agree. Another small comment that I would say is um, for the early spring, you can also do a small like cutting, um, pruning, and um, during the season, you can also do a deadheading. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, did you say chipmunks love bone meal, also bulk tone? Bone meal, chipmunks love bone meal. So <laughs> if you don't want them to dig up your bulbs, don't put bone meal in the bulb holes. They come and dig them up anyway. Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you can somehow make sure that uh, it's not obvious where you planted the bulbs, mm -hmm. um, then you, the, your bulbs might be safe. Thank you. Um, another question is, what about rows of Sharon? When should, be, should they be pruned? The rows of Sharon, I have to look at my notes, sorry. At this time of, uh, I think you can prune, the, all the roses in the fall. Uh, I think the rose of Sharon you can prune quite drastically now. Do you agree, yes. Sandra? Uh, another question is, how do you tell what kind of hydrangea, old versus new wood? No. Oh. Um, well, the hard, the paniculata have these sort of triangular shaped flowers that, that uh, change color as you go from uh, the middle of the summer to the fall. Uh, they're beautiful flowers. Sometimes they're floppy. Uh, the mop heads are round flowers. You can tell um, when you look at your plant, if the flowers are all on, um, at the end uh, of a stem. Well, it's uh, you generally what we do is keep a note of what you buy. If you buy something from the supermarket, they're usually um, flower on new wood. But the, the, the ones that grow into big, tall 
plants are usually the oak leaf and um, those varieties of um, hydrangeas that you don't, you should just leave alone. You should not prune for the best results. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions that anybody might have? Or is there any uh, clarification we might need to, to make by any chance? Okay. Um, and just in case, I will definitely be providing our information if you have any other questions that might have come to mind, or if you are interested in knowing a little bit more of our program, I am entering our information in the chat box. It is going, to, we were gonna have our email address and phone number for uh, myself or my master gardeners. And in that note, I uh, will be uh, transferring the information to Ms. Diana. Diana? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be um, putting into the chat box right now the link to the evaluation. If you could please um, fill that out. And I'm also going to be attaching the resource list that was given to us by Frida and Sandra. It's quite good. So I'm gonna add that into the chat box as well. Um, Sorry, I need my glasses. Okay, so this is a Word document that I'm putting into the chat. So to conclude the presentation, uh, we'd just like really like to thank you for attending today's um, presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, Frida. Thank you so much, Sandra. Oh, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so very much for having us, for sure. We really appreciate it. Feel free to reach out if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and that you do a wonderful job putting your garden to bed. Thank you so much, Diana. Thank you. And Vicky. Thank you, Diana. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>